is your real name. <laughs> Tough is close enough. Tough is close enough. <laughs> is that uh, something you've had almost from birth? or? Well, since 1942, anyway. Uh, where were you born? I was born in St. George. And when was that? In May of 39. And you, you grew up there? No, I grew up in Arizona. Where, whereabouts? North of Phoenix in the Bradshaw Mountains. A little place they call Bumblebee. Okay. We're, we're on a ranch? Yeah. yeah. Right, right on a ranch, but that was ranch at the time. Now, was, did he own the ranch or was he a ranch hand? He was, he was running it for the owner. Told me that. Uh, what kind of what kind of terrain was that? Was that in the mountains or? Yeah, it was rough country. Right? A lot of cat claws and mesquite brush. Show you cactus, prickly pear cactus. How do cows make a living off that kind of country? <laughs> it's tough, you know. When they drought, we had drought there one year, and they we had to burn all of the. Thorned off a prickly pear cactus for the cow to eat. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was slim pickings if it was a dry year. <laughs> it was a good year, the old dead would run a lot of cows, but in the dry, it wouldn't raise a good rattlesnake. Cows wouldn't normally eat a prickly pear cactus. Though. No, they're. Because of the thorns. You send them back to weed burners and burn the thorns oh, okay. off of them and the cows eat them. Then there should be some nutrition in Pardon? There should, should be some pretty good nutrition in Oh, yeah, that was. They survive on it, yeah. yeah. So, what, uh, you grew up there? You, uh, uh, well, we grew up. Early there, and then we moved later to down the little Buckeye, Arizona, the ranch down there. And then after the war, we moved to California, uh, Havila, California. Uh, what, what was the town in California? Havila. Havila, okay. It was the first county seat of Kern County before they moved it to Bakersfield. Oh, okay. When we lived down there, there wasn't a ranger station in us. Oh. At least a ranch up. At least a ranch there, and was up there for a couple of years, and then he sold his lease to another guy, and we moved to central Utah, just a little place north of St. George. What, what place was that? Uh, what was the town in? Central. Oh, Central. Yeah. Well, you said Central Utah. I was thinking yeah, uh, the central part of the state. <laughs> well, there, there was just where you turn off to go to Pine Valley. Yeah, just called Central yeah. Utah. Yeah. Dad bought a ranch there, and in '47 when we moved there. And then in '52 I left home and went to Wyoming and went to work. In the ranch, yeah. I, was, I feel pretty fortunate. I don't know if I got in, the, in on the last of the Roundup wagons when they, everything was still done by horses. I had an old team of horses pulled the chuck wagon and the camp equipment and everything. And we, but everything was done the horseback. There was no four wheelers and pickup trucks and horse trailers. And uh, you, you uh, had, I, I don't want to sound a little bit of a cliche, happy childhood. It sounded like you enjoyed being on a ranch. I enjoyed it. If I could have made a living for a family, I'd have never quit. You know, it's, uh, that and rodeo, and rodeo was number one for sports. Of course, I never went to school, so.
You did some rodeoing too? And oh yeah, I rodeoed and clowned a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, no, I was one of the original snowbirds. I'd go wild in the summertime in Arizona in the wintertime and worked and worked in the feedlots west of Phoenix for Jimmy Boswell. J.G. Boswell, he's a You say you didn't get much schooling. No. I, I thought cowboy paid a lot better than going to school did. <laughs> Tell us about some of your adventures in St. George at school. Well, uh, me, me and the English teacher didn't get along. In fact, the first black guy I ever had in my life was English teacher give me smacked me and I didn't know he was talking to me when he was talking and then until he hit me and then I picked up the chair and smacked him with it and left and never went back to school. <laughs> yeah. How old were you then? Uh, Eleven. I had my 12th birthday in Big Bunny, Wyoming. That's when you went up to work on the, on the ranch. Yeah, when you worked up for, for Kenneth Fear. Then I, like I say, worked for Boswell in the wintertime in Arizona sometimes, and then I worked in Young, Arizona on a ranch for a while and then, uh, then I work, went to working in the mines there out of Young Asbestos Mine. Uh, yeah, these days they'd uh, worry a little bit about your health working in the mines. Yeah, they, we didn't, it was just a job, we didn't work. Some days it was kind of wasn't manly to wear respirators and earplugs and safety glasses. We, you know, we thought we was expendable, I guess. Knock on wood, I guess. I ain't had no effect of it yet. It's a jackhammer <clears throat> with a air leg on it, so you can drill them straight ahead. Oh, okay. And it, you can drill high or low with it. It's uh, got an air-operated telescopic leg. It's like a hydraulic oh, okay. ram on it. run off of air into the hydraulics. Okay. Uh, the folks sold their ranch and moved to Mesquite here and retired here because I had a sister living here. And, When was that? They moved down here, I think, in 56. What year were you in the movies? Oh, 57, 58, somewhere in there. What was that about? Oh, I was a stuntman for Columbia Picture Company for a little while, and then I played in the movies up here at St. George. They came to Cadora with the last of that. Well, Gary Cooper and Rita Hayworth. So were, were you Gary Cooper's double or just anybody? No, I doubled for Tab Hunter. They wanted somebody that could fall off a horse? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and dude, I was just any place they wanted me. I was a stunt man. I just went wherever old Jack McCurry wanted me to go. Died where I wanted to. We'd get killed one day, and the next day we'd be on barrel detail for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I carried the F Troop guide on when they made their big charges. And I went through the Hacienda door and they set a charge off under me and killed me. Blowed me up. A lot of fun. But then I come through here to stop my ski here to visit the folks. And And they needed a powder monkey out here on the Tuli to the Desert. They had a mine out here, a little floor to floor mine. Right and a kid here in town and knew me, Bruce Woods, brother in law now. He told me to get me to come out and do their powder work for them. So I, I went out there and to mine and Instead of going back to Wyoming and stayed there until we finished, then I went to work for this Apex, the lime mine down here. Yeah. Where, where was the, is it a floor spar mine? Yeah, it's out here on the Tule Desert, north east of here. Uh, what's up? Is it up toward, in Lincoln County? Right northwest of here, yeah, in Lincoln County. It's near there to, about halfway between here and Caliani, if you. Oh, okay. Go up towards Carpel. Okay. Be no uh, floor spar, is that? Uh... They use it for fluxing in steel. Oh, okay. Yeah. But before I come to Mesquite, I guess I could back up a little bit before I have to finish with the movies. I went to work for Vera Krupp. To for who? Vera Krupp. Okay. At uh, Spring Mountain Ranch, uh, west of Vegas, over there at Red Rock. She was uh, had that Krupp diamond that what's her name bought for Liz Taylor. Oh, okay. Yeah, she was uh, she was uh, wife of the Krupp Steel Works of Germany. Okay. You know, she, Is that K R U P P? Was that? Okay, yeah. Okay, or your PP, yeah. Now that, that Spring Mountain Ranch is, is a, a heritage place now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She well, most of that outside of the county. Yeah. yeah. Uh, more ranching there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. She had some money to throw around, didn't she? Oh, yeah, she came to this country with $10 million. Oh. <laughs> she got a million dollars a year from Krupp. She was French, he was German. Were they just dabbling in it, just to have a ranch, or were they serious? Yeah, she just, you know, got divorced from more corrupt, she just ran ranch, and she lived, she didn't spend much time out there, she spent a lot of time in California, then she'd come out and spend a little time, but I think it is, the ranching part of it just, the hobby. She bought it from the Love and Abner, that little Love and Abner ranch. And then I went, went to work out here at the test site, and I had this nuclear proving ground as a miner. I worked out there as a miner, a mine mechanic. And Rig mechanic on the big old drilling rig. Mm. Off and on. It took me 35 years out there to get a 10 year pin, but I finally got one. Is that because you were going back and forth? Yeah, I'd go, yeah. Right and go someplace else. I'd stay on the job long enough to learn my first name, it's time to move. <laughs> <clears throat> I worked through all the rock contracts in the Virgin River Gorge up here. Four different contractors.
that was in the, was that in the late 60s? Early 60s. Early, early 60s. Late they 60s, started both, yeah. 63 was the first one, Bunnell. Bunnell did the first contract, and then Mullins, S.S. Mullins out of Washington did the second contract for 68, I think it was. And then Morris Knutson and then Peter Kiewit did the last big run. Mm -hmm. job. You did the blasting up there, didn't you, Tubby? Well, some of it. Uh, there's several of us involved in it. It wasn't a one-man operation, but no me. Right? But that, that's just an incredible yeah. feat of engineering, isn't yeah, it? We had, yeah, we had 32 air tracks. She would get work running on there. But most of them line holes you see, where you see them, the line drilling, a guy by the name of Vince, Gondal Vince Gonzalez mm -hmm. did most of the line drilling for us. You know, he took a lot of pride in his drilling. Yeah. Of course. So is the process that he would drill holes that you would put explosives in it? And it would yeah, yeah, he'd drill the line holes just there and then had other air tracks drilling out. And we got when we got down low enough that we could, then we moved, had some robin, what they call a robin drill. They made it mounted on D8 cats on the back of them and then had a, 1200 compression on the swing frame, and we'd take them up there and drill 10 inch holes. Mm -hmm. and you drill them for the report, put more powder in them, and get more bang, get more bounce for the out. <laughs> they, they would, I think the biggest shot we had was channel two, we put 50 ton in there. There's no channel five cut. Fifty tons of explosive. Yeah. What was the explosive that you used? We used there. We was using a water gel. Mm -hmm. It was a special because it was in the water. We had wet holes, so we used a water gel. But most of it was ammonia nitrate. Oh, okay. And we used stick stick powder for detonators, but ninety percent ammonia nitrate. Yeah, that's kind of the explosive choice for that kind of You're right. project. Yeah, it's cheap. Cheap. Mm -hmm. and cheap and it it's yields about 80%. Mm -hmm. it, like I said, it was a byproduct, a petroleum byproduct. Right. Was that a dangerous uh, place, working in the gorge? Oh, no. No, it, no dangerous in any other job. You know, if a guy knows his hazards, he can work around the hazards. And the thing is, you got to be aware of the what the hazards are, but there's, to me, there's really no more risk in it any other job you do. You know, the you know, guy can make it safe for himself or he can take unnecessary chances. And if you want to be around a while, you don't take too many unnecessary chances that they catch up. You know, we all complain about OSHA or MSHAW regulations or safety regulations. But if you take a good look at it, all them regulations was wrote in somebody's blood before they put in ink before they. So. Did you see uh, stuff like that? People get hurt, killed on the oh, job? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, seen them killed on the job. Usually because someone was careless? Yeah, just before, because he was careless or or somebody did a foolish thing. But most most of them is, was self-made. They, they wasn't, didn't have their mind on the job. So you spent what, about ten, eight or ten years working on the course? Oh no, no, it didn't even take that long to do the job. Uh, it was two years for Keywood up there. Well, all together I had probably about four years for different contractors up there. I just threw the rock. I didn't do any of the, was it wasn't the asphalt or none of that. Mm -hmm. Final prep. Just, just digging the trench so they yeah, could put a road in it. Yeah, when the last stick of dynamite went off they didn't need me no more. Or 
I didn't need them on the other. <laughs> this, then I went to Europe. Well, before I went to Europe, I went in the Pacific for a while. Now, why was that? Were you? I was on the Glomar Explorer ship. Oh, uh, that's right. We finished with it. Mothball did. I went to Europe deep ocean drilling for a couple of years. It was the Glomar Explorer. Was that Howard Hughes? Uh... No. Howard Hughes had his name on it, but Howard Hughes had nothing to do with it. Oh, okay. And the CIA. See, that's right, yeah. I mean, yeah, Howard Hughes was the front. Yeah, he was the cover, cover gal. Mm -hmm. Hughes Tool Company did make the lifting pipe that's on there for the mm -hmm. lifting fixtures, but GMDI engineered the ship and overseen it being built, built in Chester, Pennsylvania. But uh, GMDI, Global Marine Engineering Development, overseen it and operated it and yes. hired all the people. It was supposed to be deep ocean exploring and it was really spying, wasn't it? Yeah, well, no, it was made for one thing, and that's to pick up that. Sunken nuclear oh, submarine, right. submarine. They used it after that for deep ocean mining, which they called it the mining vessel, but they actually did use it once for picking up manganese and cobalt nodules off the bottom of the ocean. You were the only miner on the ship, though. The only real miner. Yeah. <laughs> Then you, then you went to Europe, you said, at uh, deep, uh, deep sea drill. Yeah. Where, where was that? Uh, Pardon? What, whereabouts in Europe? Uh, I was in the Bay of Bascone, off between north of Portugal, there, a little panhandle of Spain that reaches out across there in France. And we went up the English Channel and in the North Sea. So then there's this desert, desert kid out there on the North yeah. Atlantic. That's it was out there. I was in that Explorer, putting a pipeline in there and things. And the Lockheed cat come down there. And he told me to roll over there the boat where he get a picture. He said they know. Nobody gonna believe this. A cowboy in a rowboat inside of a ship. <laughs> I had to get a picture of it. That's, that's quite a quite a journey from a cowboy to a miner to a, um, a merchant marine. Merchant marine, and uh, then when I come back from Europe, then I went back out to test that and mine and. and to, to, uh, came back to where? Uh, the nuclear proving ground here oh. about to test that. And then I retired from Yucca Mountain as a superintendent of underground operation. That's where you could jump from the old hay shaker to uh, superintendent there. Yeah. Kind of teed my boss off that. When we went down there to Yucca Mountain, you had to have a four years of college. To, they had it, it level one, two, and three. To be level one, you're just a miner or whatever, just just a body. Level two, you had to have four years of college, um, at least a degree in geology. And to be level three, you had to have four years of college and a a degree in mining engineering. And I went down there, I was only level three in the RICO organization. And the division manager, he complained to DOE about it because he was an educated mining engineer. And he says, well, we know where your experience and education come from and we know where his experience come from and we'll take his experience over your education, so he said they ain't going to change that and that's why it's good. But I didn't like him and he didn't like me either, so we got along pretty good. <laughs> You've 
been involved in some pretty explosive situations yeah, with yeah. Uh, mining, blasting, and uh, gorge, and uh, nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was on this power line that comes through here, this 500 kV line that comes from Page. Mm -hmm. Through here, that you cross under it up here on Black Rock Boat. Cedar, or Black Rock, you know, mm -hmm. I was the GF on that power line there, right for Seaver. So I'm, I've tried a little bit of everything. I, when you say GF, uh, General Foreman. General Foreman. Yeah. I've tried a little bit of everything. I told my wife I ever found anything I was good at, I just stayed with it. <laughs> um, I've worked as a heavy equipment operator, a mechanic, heavy equipment mechanic, mine mechanic, big old reel, and I've, like I said, I've tried many and worked as many things. I guess I bluffed my way through because I never got fired for not doing my job. Got fired once for kicking the hell out of the superintendent. They hired me back and run him off. AEC decided it was justifiable so they put me back to work. How much of this did you learn from your dad? A lot of it. The mechanic and the mining and the cowboy, I'm probably 90% of it. the trade. I just kind of followed my dad's footsteps. The only, about the only thing that I, job that he had that I didn't have was lawman. He was a lawman? Yeah. Yeah, he was a territorial ranger of Arizona. Oh. What, uh, what was your dad's name? Arch Ruth. Arch? Yeah, A-R-C-H. And your mom? She's Verda, Verda Blake, maiden name. Blake. Blake? Blake was her maiden name. Oh, okay. Ruth is the last name on both right. of them. Yeah, she was a native of uh, St. George. Her, her grandpa, which had been my great grandpa, had the first sawmill on Mount Trumbull on the Arizona Strip. Oh. And the first one on Pine Valley Mountain. And she's a native of St. George. My dad was born in Mill River, Hendersonville, North Carolina. In 1886. So he did, it was probably a sign of the times he did whatever he could do to make a living. Oh yeah, he worked in the mines, he blacksmith, he had worked as a blacksmith, he's a good blacksmith. I learned a little blacksmithing from him. Uh, he said he ranched, that's how he come to Arizona. Him and his brother, they moved, come to Oklahoma during the land rush, and then ended up in West Texas. And him and his brothers got a little bunch of cows together and drove them to Springerville, Arizona from West Texas. Now they got to Arizona. Yeah. Then they, later years, they sent him up here to clean up the Arizona Strip. Outlaws off it, so that's where he met my mother and that's how I come to be. So was he in the, uh, like the Mount Trumbull part? And he was everything from here to Page, uh, Arizona, the, on the north end of the Grand Canyon. The whole Arizona Strip. He had the whole Strip, yeah. It was a fairly uh, lost place, was it not? Uh, it was the last stronghold for the outlaws. He took 32 of them out there in two years and never lost a case. You say 32? Yeah. In two years? 32 outlaws. In two years. Two, two years. Yeah. 
Were they uh, cattle thieves? Cattle thieves, most of them, yeah. They've been wanted for other things, too. There was most of them was out there on the dodge from something. And of course, there's a lot of them, like old Bill Garrett out here, and Art Coleman, and then there's uh, Jack Butler, changed his name to Butler when he came out here. He knew a lot of them guys in New Mexico and Oklahoma and that country before they come out here. Mm -hmm. and like he told a lot of them, like he told old Jack Butler and old Bill Garrett and some of them, he says, I don't care what your past is, it's what you do from now on out that counts. And there's old Eddie Yates and Bill Garrett and guys like that and Jack Butler he never did have no trouble with. They, they knew what he meant. If he had to come and get him, he'd get him. Didn't matter to him a whole lot whether they went standing up or laying down. <laughs> Any kind of lip. He kind of let that be their judgment. Whether they wanted to go stand up or lay down. In fact, he caught one guy over a canal. Chased him from House Rock Valley over to Canab. And this old boy told him, he said, I don't know how to go back with you. He said, I'm in Utah and you ain't got no jurisdiction over here. He told him, he said, I ain't no damn severe. I don't know where the line is. He said, <laughs> you need to go back sitting on that horse or laying on that horse. So he went went back. He died in prison in there, you know, this guy did. You know, he he also, while he's in jail, old Nick Graham was the jailer. And when he'd feed him, he'd come in there and Pick the key on the table and talk to him while he's eating. And this guy took the flusher rod out of the toilet and broke a piece of the toilet seat out. He burned burned the key out of that hard wood of the toilet seat. And it worked on the jail doors. <laughs> and he showed the other prisoners how to use it. Told them they could take it and leave if they wanted. And they asked him why he didn't take it and leave. He says, I'd rather die in prison be Put loose and free in Arizona, <laughs> and that's what he did. He died in prison. But for old Nick Grimm, mm -hmm. had it, the lock and the key in Vegas for a long time off that jail, and after he died, I don't know what happened to it. But it, well, Nick Grimm kept that lock and key for years. So. There's just so many directions to go here. <laughs> well, they didn't touch on his prospecting days yet. Well, I was going to get to that. I thought I'd get a little bit of family stuff. You, you met a girl here? Yeah, my wife went to the high school here. She was born in Lincoln County, but her dad had a little ranch yeah, in Barkley, Nevada, which her grandparents settled Barkley. She came here because there was no high school where she was? Is no, they just went. went through the grades up there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what, what's her name? Woods was her maiden name, Arfa. A-A-R-O-R-P-H-A. -A -R -R -A. Yeah. Yeah, she, she probably had relatives here, didn't she? Oh yeah, her mother, this big diploma sitting in here in the yeah. room, that's her mother. Sure, her mother was... Uh, uh, Hardy. Hardy, okay. Yeah. So, so her, her, mom, her grandma and grandpa on her mother's side was the first five on the, the first five families to settle this year. So you you couldn't have come in here and start shooting up without hitting a cousin of some sort. Throwing rocks. You better be careful where you throw the rock. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, because I we were related both on both sides, on the mother's side and the Blake side and the party side. I told him I was put up, put up job how I got in the skeet there. Just when I went to work out here on this Tule Desert on this mine I was talking about, as her little brother had wanted me to come out there and volunteered me to go out there and do that. And when we got through it, it was her big brother told me they needed the driller down here at this lime mine, and I went down there to do the drilling. And 
hung around here and married your little sister, so I told him it was a put-up deal. <laughs> you know, my father-in-law said he raised five boys, and my wife was the only cowboy he had. He said them boys got big enough to be any good, they all wanted to go to Caliani and chase the girls. Then uh, you were involved in the the mining around here, weren't you? Just a prospect around here, and I did I drilled I did dig a shaft up here on the mountain and run a couple little exploration drifts for combine metals. Mm -hmm. And many geologists surveyed 52 claims on this old mountain. That was brilliant. I never could find where it come from. It just float. You, you found traces of beryllium, but you couldn't yeah. find the source. Huh? There was no source, yeah, just yeah. float. Yeah, just. So you were working with a geologist? Yeah. Said, yeah. Pebble pin. Source of beryllium, that'd be quite lucrative, wouldn't it? That would, yeah. They had the, they had the biggest outcroppings in the North America on this Bunkerville Mountain of beryllium, but it was just float, it just surface. There's nothing. Pretty crystals, little stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, I did a lot of prospecting in the New York mountains of California. That's just south of Vegas, ways. Down in a little old sinking little shaft, my dad would most of the time would drill because he could drill faster than I was. We drilled by hand. You know, He'd usually drill and I'd shoot if he could drill faster than I would sometimes I'd drill. But anyway, we was down in this little old shaft where it was sinking about 10 or 12 feet. And I got down in there and loaded around, get ready. I told him when I spit it, I need some help out. And he says, oh, when you get ready to get out of the holler, I'll help you. So I I spit around and hollered and nobody come and I I think I scratched more dirt back in that hole and I shoveled out of it in a week. Uh, and while you're trying to get out of that, the fuse looked like it was burning about 10 foot of a second there. And boy, I scratched, scratched and got out. And of course, after I got out, then they, they quit burning. I, just, I didn't think they was ever going to go off. And when it went off, you time them, you know, so you can count them so you know every hole went off. So you, and I asked my dad, I'd done him, where are you at? You're going to help me out if I need to help out. Oh, he says, I figure if you need any help out, it'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to be down there when it went off. <laughs> no, he, he knew it was going to, he had plenty of time. But me being just a little snot-nosed kid, I figured I'd run out of time in a hurry. What were you looking for there? <clears throat> we were silver and we had a little so we're digging there we played with and then there's some golden area we played with. This one particular place was thorium. You know, thorium is what they use in the wick of a Coleman lantern. Oh yeah. So the glow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people holler about this radiation fall out and then they all got Coleman lanterns and where do you change the wick on it? Cold my lantern. Set it on your table, change the wick, and then go make yourself a sandwich of that old heavy metal, you know. It's is it radioactive or just heavily? You bet it is. It's that's radioactive. What, that's what we use to calibrate our machines with oh. out there at the test site, was it? 
wick of a coal mine liner. Because it's a known source. So. The mining area, I think you said once that uh, maybe speculation is an understatement. Yeah. Uh, the, the purpose of the mining here was maybe not so much to find minerals as it was to find investors. Well, uh, most of that was here. They had, and I like this apex, well, was, uh, and then this gold strike up here at both, they was, they did find enough, you know, it, it was commercial ore. So if you get a assay, it shows commercial ore and everything, and then they form a corporation, then they can get it on the stock market. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing, like I said, it was just, to me, it's just an honest way of stealing. Yeah. You know, they form a corporation and hire people and they pay themselves big money and their brother or their whoever, their good buddies, high wages, and then when the stockholders don't start getting return and quit investing, then they dissolve the corporation and they leave with a pocket full of money and the investors leave with an empty pocket. But it's surprising to me how many people get stung time and two or three times off one of them promotion, get rich team, you know, especially gold. You mention gold and right away they see dollar signs and they'll invest. And some of them know before they invested they lost their investment. And they just, it's a form of gambling. Yeah, they all do is they gamble. They, sometimes it pays off. I don't know if some of them have, have invested that penny gold stock and made a bunch of money out of it. But most of these little mining projects around here are, are just promotion. It's, Like the, the guy, one of the promoter, promoters here on this tri-state, when he left, after he left here, he went went to the pen for selling claims that he didn't own. And Charlie Howell, it was Bertha Howell's <coughs> husband, she, he, he did a little time in prison for mining scams. Is that before he came here? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't remember the story. I heard old Charlie tell it, but I don't remember it. The whole thing, I didn't pay that much attention to it. I wasn't too interested in crooked deals anyway. <laughs> And you, uh, through all this, I get the impression that you're at heart, you're a cowboy. Is that yeah, I'm still at heart. I'm a he does his own leather work. Well, yeah, I've made a few saddles. And, you know. and every day in the end, somebody come by and want me to repair one, I'll repair one. You, you talked about, you said your dad knew Bill Garrett. Oh yeah, he knew, he knew Bill Garrett before he came in this country. What was his name, Art Coleman? Was that? Art Coleman was the guy that was with him. Oh, well, with him, that little guy. Yeah. Um, and then Eddie Yates, he knew Eddie Yates, he was out there at Tassai. Of course, Eddie Yates is buried in Williams, Arizona. Him and his daughter and son are all buried in Williams. They, they say that uh, Bill Garrett was Pat Garrett's nephew, is that a myth? Uh, or? I think that's a myth. I don't think that was a true uh, true statement. Some of them say it wasn't. Had, had he been in trouble with the law? Garrett? Yeah, yeah. He went to Wyoming. He was in trouble with the law. He went up there. And he got in trouble up there. He killed a guy up there in northern Colorado, the supposedly northern Colorado. They're going to hang him. 
in Colorado. They done tried him, we're gonna hang him, and a bunch of them got together from over there, Vernal, went over there and proved that he killed this guy in Utah, not in Colorado, and it's self-defense. So they turned him loose, and that's when he come down here on this trip. He maveraged a few cattle and prospected out there, had a little gold digging. Did you know him? Yeah. You knew him? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, the first time I old met old Bill Garrett was out there at Cowboy and old Newt Mundy and I for Frank Taylor. And we went in there and old Newt Mundy introduced to me to him. He said, Ruth. <coughs> He says, you're one of Archer's boys to his second marriage. He says, by God, I've known old Arch for 400 years. <laughs> I never met him in the evening more about men than about myself the first time I met him. Well, there wasn't a lot of population out here, so people tended to, to know each other, didn't they? Yeah, they everybody knew pretty much. You couldn't hardly move without somebody knowing about it. Yeah. He was in the area very long. Yeah, boy, like I said, old Bill knew my dad years ago, knew, and his baby brother worked for dad for a long time, Jack, and he got killed in France during World War I. Oh, okay. um, Jess Fears from down there at Payson brought old Jack's saddle back. Then he had a brother, Ed. He had a feedlot in Kansas, Ed did. And when he when Bill died, he came out here and died and Ed went out to go butte together. Like I say Dad was a long time friend of that bunch of boys. A lot of characters. Yeah. First time. I told Dad I wasn't too sure if they didn't pardon him from prison if he'd take the ranger job. <laughs> That uh, Jess Spears that brought Jack Saddleback. Him and Dad joined the Rangers together. Mm -hmm. And then later years, I don't think it was back in 1912 or something, 13, Dad and Jess Spears built the first Ranger station on Pine Top, Arizona, Pine Top, Arizona. That they first. Dad's first wife was, they called her Ma Ruth, she was, she's in the Guinness Book of Records. She retired undefeated world champion fiddle player. <laughs> of course her dad, Grandpa Hopin, he was instrumental in the capture of Geronimo. My oldest brother, he was born in the Arizona Territory, Holbrook. He was born in 1911, Arizona, then he come to stay until 12. So you, you were in the younger section of the yeah, family? Yeah, I was in the second family. Second family, and yeah. your dad was considerably... He was, yeah, he was 30 years older than my mother. Yeah. yeah. So you had some connections to the old days there. Yeah, I first. remember. People will think, look at me like that's crazy or something when I tell them my granddad fought in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Grandpa Ruth, uh, well, he spent most of the Civil War in a Yankee prison camp. And he, he was, my dad's oldest sister, he, she was born in the year the Civil War ended. She was born in 67. Has your, has your father's story been written down? No. That would be, that's a bit of a loss, isn't it? He must yeah. have a lot of stories to tell. No, he, he had a lot, of, you know, this Jack Butler I tell him about, he, he's over here one day and I'd heard he died, but he was topped over here. He trapped ahead of the sheep, sheep people, you know, and coyotes, bobcats, whatever. He, Line, whatever it might be, getting her sheep. And he was over here and I told him, I said, why don't you go up and visit Dad? He said, well, I heard he passed away. I said, no, he lives up there. And I said, hell, we thought you cratered. And he, he went up, I'd like to have a recorder. I said, I had a recorder in them days, and them two old 
Moss backs, they started back there in Oklahoma and fought their way out here. But he was one of the first guys that Dad went into out here on the strip. And, and he called him by his real name. Dad never did call him Butler. He called him by his real name. And he, uh, he looked around to see who was asking about him. And he, he seen who it was. He walked over and he says, this is a hell of a place to come to repent from your sins, ain't it? <laughs> Yeah, there was there's some tough old cookies on that Arizona strip, but there's from <coughs> colorful old guys too. And they, like old Bill Shanley, he was a hard away. He broke out of the Colorado state pen. And he escaped on the warden's horse, <laughs> and he ended up out here. He, <laughs> Flash Jacob bought his place out here on the strip. You know, they, there's quite a bunch out there at one time, but they still, well, there's still a lot of guys. There's some of the second generation, mm -hmm. still around, most of them three generations now out there. Yeah, it's tough living, isn't it? It is tough living out there, and it's a long ways. No. But it was a good life. It was, like I said, but that one thing about ranching, it's either feast or famine anyway, you know. Yeah. You only got two paydays a year. That's one in the spring when you ship your calves or cattle or one in the fall and you gotta stretch them out. And if you got a real bad Bad year, drought year, then you gotta sell your herd way down and then get a good year, you gotta borrow money to build your herd back up. And you, this country where a cow's gotta walk a mile and a half to get a mouth of grass. Yeah, they have to graze at 80 mile an hour to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they figure, of course, years ago, back in the 20s and 30s, it's a lot different than it is now. They had wetter winters and things. But they figure now, you know, most of this country around here about a cow to the section. Mm -hmm. This area down here. But at one time, Preston Nutter run 10,000 head of cows on the strip. You can't even water that many out there now. But there's still quite a bunch of cows that out from that strip. Garden, gardeners had cattle out there and Esplins and oh, Buster Esplin, he was the last of the big out, biggest outfits out there. I think he had about 1,500 head of mother cows, but he bought the remnants of the old Nutter's place. But they, one time they owned a bunch of sheep out there. Hell, they sheared 50,000 sheep out here on this Mormon Mesa every spring. Wow. Everybody in the country had, had sheep, I think. Sheep business and one of them the cattle business. So you you've actually lived in constant change, haven't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've seen a lot of changes in my short time. Like I said, I felt I was pretty fortunate. Like I said, to get in on the last of their old roundup. They was doing everything on horseback. We run cattle when we come up. We run cattle from uh, the mountain meadows up here what they call pin on grass valley. When we moved up there, I was I think nine years old. And eight or nine, and my dad told me to go over in this area they called Horse Valley. And told me what he wanted me to do, and I says, I don't know that country, I've never been over there before. He says, just go there and get lost, you'll learn it. <laughs> <laughs> the way I went. Him and, the, him and this old George Lytle, uh, two, them two guys who tried to give out horse for them, most people could have, freshmen, 
I told you, they'd put a hundred miles on a horse in a day if they just went from point A to point B. Miss old George Lytle, and they were both old men by the time I was big enough to ride with them. And I still didn't like to ride with them. They'd ride you to the ground. Yeah. But this old George Lytle get up in the morning and he'd put two or three pieces of raw bacon between a you know, bacon powder biscuit and away you'd go. He could ride further on raw bacon and a bacon powder biscuit than anybody had ever seen. You know, he rim an old old man, a good old man. And that's the he, he had the Lytle Ranch that's up mm -hmm. up here. It's now uh No, he was he was up here on the Beaver Dams. Yeah. <clears throat> no. He was out here on the Tule Desert and then his headquarters was at the Mountain Meadows. Oh, okay. And then he run cattle out on the strip. This Tal Lytle was a different family of Lytle. Oh. Probably distant kinfolk. Oh, okay. Away. But, uh, the different Lytle ones. And what when you were in Europe, did you visit some of the cities there? No, no I didn't do much travel. Didn't do much travel. I just did my thing. Caught on. The, well, we went from Bayonne, southern France, we hit some places there to Paris and whatnot. I went much besides here. I didn't care. Didn't care for. Didn't care for the people of the city. So. I, Southern France, they had some pretty places, some pretty things, but I, and the people were pretty decent, but that city I didn't like. When, when you were away from this region, did you miss it? Oh. Did you give it any thought? When I was gone, yeah, you, you missed, but I knew this old Gadotter kind of grows on you. You know, I like to, like to where to hear water and see you streams running, but this old desert kind of grows on you too, actually. You know, I've rode, rode a horseback from Mesquite here to Clover Valley, up where my wife is from, in a day, time or two. I rode from that Tile Lytle's place, just talking about it, I rode from there to Mesquite once bareback. I think my legs were six inches longer when I got here. <laughs> Just thinking about it. Yeah. How far is Clover Valley? It's uh, uh, nautical miles. I'd say it's probably about forty nautical miles. But the way you got to ride, it's probably close to hundred miles, eighty to hundred miles of horseback. If you take all the twists and turns. Yeah. And, you know. They ain't very four nautical miles, but the way you gotta go, but the way you gotta drive, it's, you gotta go plumb to Enterprise or Caliani. Mm -hmm. You gotta drive halfway around the world to get there. But, yeah. It sits about halfway between Enterprise and Caliani okay. on the Nevada side. But it's, uh, Clover Valley, they call it, but it's Barkley. Either one. In, in your wanderings around here, are there places you call your favorites? Things that stand out in your mind? Well, probably my favorite is around here would be out on the parish out in Arizona Strip, on the right here close. First, I was, there are several places around here that you might call your favorites, but I always like like that parish out out there on the strip. Pretty free and open and... Yeah, there ain't nothing around. You're just 80 miles from nobody and it's mm -hmm. nice and quiet out there. It's kind of like old Bill Shanley said though, it's an 80 mile ride of horseback to prime you to the Virgin River to get enough water to prime your pecker so you can pee. <laughs> Don't think I can top that. No, no. <laughs> quite the guy. He kept old Dick Hammer and beef for years. I know Dick Hammer probably sold beef there 30 years before he sold the legal one there. <laughs> Well, I 
appreciate your time. I bet you there's more, but. Oh, yeah, I can go on and on. You know, I covered a lot of country for a young guy. Just. Hmm. You're a bit of a, the, the, the word's anachronism, a little bit of out of your, out of time because of your, your father being so much older than you. Yeah, I think I was born about 30 years too late or something. We had a good relationship, uh, my dad and I. We spent a lot of time together in later years, and then, you know, we prospected a lot together. We sit around a campfire and exchange for stories a little bit. You weren't afraid of hard work. Oh no, that's one thing my daddy said. Kent was. He can build a boot shop in your butt and hurry. He didn't, two words he didn't like, can't or forgot. To him, can't was lazy and forgot was dead. Uh, he says, a guy might not know how to do it, but he can learn. And he didn't like to hear that can't. And it's true, you know, you can do about whatever you set your mind to do. I needed a job and they'd hire them. Whatever they'd hire them for, I could do. That's what I was, you know. You need to mine when I was a miner. You need to cowboy the cowboy. If you need to lineman, when I was lineman. And you need to driller, I was driller. I might not have seen that drill before, but I can figure it out in a minute. Yeah. Hand it to me and get out of my way. We'll make it do something. Do you ever get on a horse these days? I haven't been on a horse. It's been, uh, it's been seven, eight years since I've been on a horse. I had my daughter's horse down here. I broke it to where you'd saddle it and lead it, broke it to lead and where you'd saddle and everything, but I, I never did get on him. Of course, I was having a few heart problems at the time, so I didn't get on the old horse, but when I got through it, my daughter took it home and she rode it and she never did try to buck with or nothing. No. But I had him where you'd throw the saddle at him and you'd stand there, never paid attention to it. She <coughs> put the old saddle hanging up there in my shop that's about 60 years old. Mm. My new saddle, my baby daughter, I told her she's got everything I own. She's got my my saddle, my shafts, my spurs, my rope, <laughs> my bow cell. Is your wife still alive? Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, she, yeah, she retired two years ago from the school district. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how many kids? I had seven. There's all boys but five. <laughs> got 42 grandkids and six great. Last count, anyway. Yeah, yeah, you can, that can change. Yeah. And you enjoy them? Enjoy the devil out of them. I go up there and one daughter's got a, her and her husband's got a little ranch up in Lincoln County. And I got a trailer up there. I go up and spend a little time up there. <coughs> he's a general contractor, but he, he forms a couple hundred acres. He's got a couple of hundred head of cows. So I'll go up there and play with him. Uh, you, you worked hard to make a living. I mean, hard work. And yeah, I always work. did. You know, hard work never hurt nobody. I've always worked. But, uh, job was considered that most people wouldn't like, you know, mining or stuff, mm -hmm. but I enjoyed it, you know, it's, we worked hard, we played hard, mm -hmm. we fought hard. Us cowboys used to go to town Friday night to fight the roughnecks. That was kind of a, kind of a hobby with us. 
there in the early and mid 50s. Go, go to town Friday night and fight the Roughnecks. Do pretty good, and then the Roughnecks change shifts on us. There's three shifts to Roughnecks and only one shift to Cowboys. When I rodeoed, I liked rodeo on a you know, four sport. I, of course, most, when I rodeoed, most of the rodeo cowboys was working cowboys. There wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of cowboys that followed it mm -hmm. like they did when the business like it is today. It's more of a sport, you know. Uh, it's a business now. But back then, you know, Jim Shoulders, the first year he won the world, I think he won $14,000. Now oh, they can win that much in eight seconds. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. I would, you know, I'd, I stayed with the rough stock events, mostly the saddle broken bulls and barebacks. If it was close to the home ranch where I could ride my horse, then I might get in on the rope, and, but if I had to haul them, I didn't. Like a lot of little rodeos, like uh, county. Small. Yeah, there's little county fairs and little town rodeos. Most of them, yeah, they just. I did compete in professional rodeos, several of them, and it just happened to be close. and junior rodeos and high school rodeos. I found for a lot of them and judged a lot of high school rodeos. You did, you say you did a clowning for them? Yeah. How many broken bones have you had? I don't know. A bunch of them. Oh. I had one old doctor said I had the awfulest looking bunch of ribs that he ever looked at. I told him probably no bull didn't like the way they looked either and rearranged them. We didn't worry much about broken bones unless it's, you can walk on it. <laughs> the old cowboys had broken bones they never knew they had, but somebody took an x-ray on them. How long do you have that? When did you break that arm? When did you break that? <laughs> Hell, I don't know. I didn't know it was broke. You didn't go looking for the easy life, I <laughs> Oh, no. I you know, didn't have time to sit around and sniffle and whine. You no. Know, you got bumped and bruised, you went to work. You didn't, there was no such thing as light duty or that. You either, you either come to work and did your job, or they get somebody else at work. I said, it was something real serious. And, you know, if you got a finger or something cut off, you take two or three days off. And, uh, all right, but after that, you better come back to work and somebody will have your job. <laughs> Yeah. Making that big money. When I first went to work for Cowboy and they're making that big money, you know, three dollars a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course that was probably uh, mm -hmm. seven days a week, wasn't it? Seven days a week and how many hours a day ever it took. It didn't matter whether from before daylight and black and dark. You know, and we didn't worry about how many hours there was in the day. We didn't, we didn't measure days and hours. It just whatever, whatever time it took to do the job it was on that time. If it took 12 hours, you stayed there 12 hours. If it took 20 hours, you stayed there 20 hours. You know, and summer and up there in the roundup, we'd have to 
Nighthawk and Carol would get them gathered up and Nighthawk them all night. Because about, if the wind didn't blow about 10 o'clock in the morning, them old, what they call the heel flies, would hit them cows. And then they'd stick your tail straight up over the back and you'd see 15,000 head of go, cows go 15,000 different directions. And then you'd, then you'd all afternoon and gathering them up and hold them all night so you work them again the next day until the flies hit them. And I said if they, you prayed for a little wind about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, a little breeze to keep the flies away, it was all right. Did you do any uh, long cattle drives? No, um, probably 130 miles is the longest one. We used, we used to trailer cows from the old pal. Wyoming to the railroad and ship and the rail and the truck and everything. Well, Pinedale is, I think it's 130 miles from Pinedale to Old Pile. That was the longest drive they had. Pinedale is the longest place, the furthest place in the continental United States away from the railroad. Oh. Everything, and then everything, well, even the hay and everything was still done by horses, you know. Mm -hmm. We had uh, the ranch that I worked for had 32 teams of horses that they had, and then they stored it hay. And then 1955, then they went to tractor, tractor, and, and tractor mowers and power buck rakes. They still put it up loose. They put it up loose until the late 50s and then they went to bailing it. Yeah, it's a, they say it was kind of a tough old life, hard to get. We stay out there in a line camp. This Joe Christman and I weighed out there. He's one line camp and I another. We'd stay out there all summer. You know, you, you can't get Cowboys go out there and stay now all summer. Uh, you know, they got to have a pickup truck and a horse trailer. Uh, we go out there and stay, and then the only transportation we had was a horse and one of the town. You know, that it probably 50 miles of town, get on and ride into town. If you didn't, you stay down. Get a, if you get a whiff of hay these days, does it bring back some memories? Yeah, it reminds me of what I don't want to go back to doing that hay. <laughs> that hay is just like making concrete. There ain't no easy way. <laughs> I didn't, if I can do it on horseback, it's all right, but I didn't much care. Of course, that was part of the deal, you know. When cows was paying the bills, you had to take care of them because they was your bread and butter. Your hang was different than my hang. Your hang was forks putting up on the yeah. racks and then putting what the Mormon derricks or uh... we had what they call the beaver slide. Oh. We didn't use the derricks like they use. We used the beaver beaver slide. It had a big plunger, but it, the horses get on. They push it up this big ramp, beaver slide, and it fall oh, off. Okay. They back up and they sweep. Get a horse here and here, and it had fingers out in front of me. Go down the wind roll and pick it up. Lay it up on this thing, and they'd back up, and then they'd push it. And they had to maybe they had one of these forks laid down here, take your leg, and, and they'd stand up, and the team of horses would pull it up over there. And we had the sides on this beaver slide, you know, and just to stack it. And then when you get it up high at the top of that beaver slide, then you'd take the team and slide it ahead. You'd make several stacks end to end. And it, it, it was a little faster than the old. Than just a fork in a rack. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, like I said, the, the old Mormons come out that old gin pole and the ropes, you know, they'd take it, pick it up, swing it around there and pull a trip and that one end of that rope would drop and drop the hay and then, then they could drop the rope, go back and get another and they'd put about, that uh, one layer of that rope they put right on the wagon box and they'd load it up about half of the load, and they'd put another set of them ropes on it. And when they get that on there, they go to the stack, they fold it up and hooked in a hook. And one of the hooks 
tripped when they pulled that knife, dropped one in and dropped the hay out of the pile. Then, then they later they had them old Jackson forks, you know, and the borns and the little forks like a clam jar and needles and reach down there and grab my hay, you stomp it in the hay and pick it up and the horse would pull it up and you pull it back where you want it to get the string and they'd open it dump it. It was kind of slow. The hay was stacked right, you could get a pretty good load in it, but if it wasn't, well, you didn't get much hay in it. Them old rope nets were good as anything that way. Wow. It was. Sure made it nice and run to bail into the forest. Moving hay. Well, good. But you could feed. When we went to Balin, Balin, we still had the wintertime up there in Roman and had to feed with bobsleds. There's no snow to get, you couldn't get out there with tractors and things. You had to use a team of horses and them old bobsleds. And it sure made it nice when Balin was just, one guy could go out there and feed four times as many cows as four yeah. guys could with digging that old frozen hay up loose. <laughs> Got out there one time in a hurry. But Bob said, I was in a, in a hurry, it's cold, 30, 40 below, and in a hurry. And then Bob said, there's cross chain, there's runners on them, and they turn square. You turn the front, the hind end turns too. So, man, I swung that team out, and then back, runners running the haystack, and there I stuck in the haystack. So, then what you do, you get off and unhook your team, and go hook on the back of the wagon, pull it out of the stack. If you get in a hurry, you just get yourself in the bind. <laughs> you're in a hurry, get down in a hurry, you end up being an hour longer than you would have if you just took your time. You learn them kind of, them kind of things you learn. Like I say, my old daddy said, if, if you learn from your mistakes, they're good mistakes. If you keep on making them, then they're bad mistakes. But you know, you got to make mistakes to learn. And I was the same way there. If I had you working for me, I'd rather have a guy who worked for me that made a poor decision and no decision at all. And, you know, I didn't, didn't much care having people around me that couldn't think for themselves. You had to tell them every move to make. I didn't need them. Trouble with a lot of these now that some of these bosses don't want them to move until I tell you to. And, you know, they act like they're afraid you're going to get your job if you think for yourself, you know what I mean? And not, not me, if they can't think for themselves and they see things that need to be done and can't do it, well, I don't, I don't need them because they're going to finish a job and sit on their buns until I come back and tell them to move. I don't need them. They go someplace else. Well, good. Like I told them, man, I have a note and a sign hang up my mechanic shop out there and clean up after yourself, your mother don't work here. <laughs> what, what about <coughs> your mother? What, uh, what was she like? You talked a lot about your dad. But... Oh, she was just a rancher's wife. She was, well, she was one of the ranch hands some of the time. Her and her sister, her, one of her, her sisters lived with us for a long time down there in Arizona. And, they was both good hands of horseback. They, they did not take no back seat to the average man when it comes to cowboy. But she was a good cook. She's she's a good homemaker. She was. I know all of the all of her relatives and things that came out there. Oh, we wouldn't live like this. Live out here like this. They didn't. None of them want to live like that. But boy, they sure have to come out there and stick their knees under her table and, and let her weight on them. But they weren't going to live like it. But every chance they got, they'd come out there and stick their knees under her table. But she canned a lot of fruit and she made, we raised about everything that we eat. I go to the store and buy a little flour, baking powder, and coffee, sugar, and stuff of that nature. And, Good, but 
I could go on for hours, but I am. Yeah, we can go all day. A lot of trails to cross. Yeah. You know, I said I covered a lot of country in a short time. I always I had an aunt, my dad's sister-in-law. She told me one time. She said, that, "You know, you're just like your uncle Jinx and your dad." And he said, "Somebody tells you a rancho with a mountain, you got to go there to see if it's there or not." You know? <laughs> she says, "You know, a rolling stone don't collect no moss." And I says, "Nobody to get off a slate." <laughs> she uh, she cooked it for the Apache. She was a good cook too. You like to see what's over the next hill? Oh yeah, I was always looking over the hill there. See, somebody said there's something more. Well, I had to go try it out and see if it's there. But, like I said, I started out at a young age of doing it. I was 11 years old when I left home. And then, been on the bum ever since. Uh, I told the wife when I got married, I said, I guess you know you ain't doing no you ain't marrying nothing but a bum. She said she didn't realize how big a one it was until she married him. <laughs> she said she seen more more country the first six months she's married to me and she's seen the rest of her life. But I ventured out even after married and ventured out. She stayed here when we were in the raising family. She says, finally ain't gonna see 15 different homes a, a year. She so this was your base. But yeah, yeah, she stayed here and I ventured out. I used to, used to tell them, my wife would tell me that my check was $500 or bigger and bring it if it's smaller, mail it. <laughs> <laughs> she basically raised them seven kids for herself, you know. She was, I spent, no, I spent more time at home when I was working in Europe than I did when I was working in the States. Because you had that regular time off. Yeah, we worked 28 days on and 28 days mm -hmm. off. So I had about a 27 day weekend at home. Working out here at the test site, uh, we'd work, we'd have a, Experiment. We worked seven days a week until we got through with it. Twenty-four hours around the clock, so you didn't get home until the event was over. And then we worked five days a week, so you didn't get a whole lot of time at home. Many of them just just four hours driving home, and then just four hours driving back. So eight hours of that weekend you spent on the road. Yeah. Cowboy to the nuclear age. Yeah. Seen it all. <laughs> That's where my daddy was, you know. He come west in the covered wagon and seen the first man walk on the moon. Oh. He's seen a lot of changes in his time. How old was he when he died? Eighty two. Been gone forty years last May. I always remember that. He died on my 30th birthday. I buried him on my 30th birthday. He died. May 14th. He buried him on the 14th. He died on the 10th in Jackson, Tennessee. Well, good. I think uh, I've got more than enough to try to figure out now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> A lot of a lot in between there that to be filled in, you know. I mean, it's that, that's that's right. Uh, this is just a sketch. You know, well, when I went to work at the test site, the first time I went out there, you had to go back five years, you know. Well, least, for your background change. Yeah, you had to go back five years to write off the start. 
I said, man, I can't remember yesterday everything I did. <laughs> you know, five, we were trying to remember th everything I did in every place I've been in five years. Well, well I says, if, if a guy wasn't a liar when he went to work here, he will be after he leaves here. <laughs> trying to figure out where you've been. And you know, trying to get it through some of them secretaries' heads, you know, where'd you live? Where'd you grew up in Bumblebee, Arizona, Castle Hot Springs, or Rock Springs? Well, what was your address? What's the address? <laughs> well, what was your zip code? They didn't have no such animals. Uh, well, you had to have some kind of, I said, that's the address, young lady, Bumblebee, Arizona. All it was a little old store. And uh, when the ranchers come in to buy groceries or something, the storekeeper would give them the mail. He'd sort it, tie it together the string, and when you come in and get your groceries or something, he'd give it to you. And everybody on the ranch's mail would be in one bundle, and you'd the lady of the house would get home, she'd be screwed up the mail. And I said, I don't know how much plenty you can put it in that. <laughs> well, then this Dale Thebus, this old Oki boy, he was there. And he, He's in about a half a stupor, you know, about half a drunk. The secretary said, where are you from? He says, Oklahoma. He said, where'd you go to school? He says, turkey crossing. Well, how far did you go to school? And he said, there. She says, don't you know how far you went to school? He said, just a minute, I'm thinking. Oh, he said, about 30 miles. <laughs> I tell you, when them secretaries got rid of us miners, I bet they're the happiest girls in the world. And old Jim Mason, the old boy, he was the first Q cleared miner on the test site, nevertheless. He passed out while they interviewed him. Today, you know, if you even looked like you had a drink, they wouldn't even talk to you, let alone hire you. He was, he was, uh, I told him, it's easy. They said, how do you get a Q clearance so quick? And I said, then that four would go very far back to check him. Lincoln County Jail was his residence. But <laughs> <laughs> the old, the old Jim, he said to be a miner, he said, to be a miner you gotta belong to the APA Association. The American pack ass. <laughs> About sure he grab a jack leg and a hundred foot of hose and take off the whole jack leg weigh a hundred pounds and I'm counting the holes and real steel. Good old days. We had a lot of fun though, I like said. Yeah. Worked hard and played hard. Well good. Well I I really enjoyed this. So yeah, interesting. Well, but I think it's only I think it's only part one. That's right. Yeah we're a cowboy, you know and, we hurt each other more playing with each other than we did anything else, you know. Yeah. One we didn't kill each other, some of the pranks we pulled on each other. Well, that's why I asked you about broken bones. You couldn't yeah. have got through all that without broken bones. Oh, you got a few of them here and there.